So welcome again. I'm going to turn it over to Jason to introduce our speakers. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Thank you to everyone who's joining today. As Lauren said, I'm Jason Richter. I'm the chief engineering geologist at MnDOT. I'm also the technical liaison for this project, which you've all seen by now is titled Seismic Approach to Quality Management of HMA. Presenting today, we'll have the principal investigator for the project, Dr. Chun Park, who is the founder and principal geophysicist at Park Seismic. He'll also be joined by co-principal investigator, Dr. Nils Ryden of Lund University, who, and he also works for Norfi Tech, which are both based in Sweden. Um, Dr. Josephine Starkhammer is also a co-PI, but uh, she is unable to join us today. And I'll say more about them a little bit later, but first a little background about this project. This project got underway at the beginning of 2020. It's funded by the NRA through the Intelligent Construction Technologies team, and you can read more about that on the project website. Goal of this project is to develop a device and software which will allow us to characterize newly paved HMA in terms of shear wave velocity. Specifically, the device will be capable of measuring surface wave velocity by using a multi-channel air coupled approach and this is unlike ground coupled approaches which have been available for many years for both subsurface and pavement characterization unlike those approaches it'll be capable of acquiring continuous seismic data at subhighway speeds while also acquiring pavement temperature measurements and gps data seismic data from multiple 1d arrays will be processed and will allow for visualization and 2d surface models which will be georeferenced for importing into veda software as a bonus the analysis module and the software will also be capable of outputting layer thickness a little more regarding our speakers uh, this project requires quite a bit of um, or at least an advanced level of geophysical and ndt expertise and this is where doctors park and ryden come in Dr. Park is a household name for us in the geotech engineering industry, <clears throat> where he's credited with the development of a seismic geophysical method termed the multi-channel analysis of surface waves, or MASW for short. It's commonly what we use in subsurface investigations. Chun also has extensive experience with coding geophysical processing software, having developed his own software termed Park Size, and which is also being customized for this project. Dr. Nils Redden is a senior lecturer at Lund University and research director for Norfi Tech, which are both based in Sweden. He brings a vast amount of experience with NDT methods, specifically the acoustical method of measuring surface wave waves, which he's been researching for the past few years and is the basis for this project. Um, to learn more about this project, you can visit, like I said, the NRA website, or better yet, you can visit Dr. Park's website at parkseismic.com. Com. And with that, I'll turn it over to our PI and main presenter today, Dr. Chun Park. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> yeah, it was a very uh, nice summary of the uh, uh, this uh, project, and uh, it was a very good introduction. Um, uh, we actually made a uh, quite similar presentation uh, back in uh, September uh, last year. Uh, I believe it was uh, during one of those uh, NRRA uh, webinar series. Uh, but since then, we have made the, uh, significant uh, progress and also uh, made uh, some changes. So uh, I would consider this time uh, will be kind of project update presentation. So uh, as Jason mentioned, the, uh, this is about a project uh, launched at MMDOT uh, January of last year, January 2020. Uh, as a two-year project uh, that tries to develop a complete system consisting of both hardware components and also software package to evaluate uh, stiffness and thickness of uh, HMA, hot mix asphalt layer, by using a seismic approach. So I will present the Park Seismic, which is a prime contractor for this project. And the, uh, Dr. Jim Park also uh, joins this uh, project as the uh, operation and administrative staff. And uh, this particular seismic uh, approach, as Jason mentioned uh, previously, uh, is called the uh, non-contact seismic approach, which was uh, developed by uh, Dr. Ryden and Dr. Starkarmer at Norfitech, uh, based in Lund, Sweden. 
So they are quite naturally joining uh, us for this uh, uh, project as uh, co-investigators. So uh, Norfitec is in charge of developing all the hardware components and the Park Seismic is in charge of uh, oversighting the entire project and also developing uh, the software package. So uh, again, uh, as Jason mentioned, if you visit Park Seismic uh, uh, homepage, you will find that there is a link uh, for this special website uh, dedicated for this project. Uh, there you will be able to find not only uh, the administrative aspects, but also all technical aspects of this uh, project. And uh, we have been updating uh, uh, the, uh, the, the web page uh, every month by posting our monthly progress. So if you wish to know more about this project, please feel free to visit there. So uh, basically we are trying to measure uh, stiffness and uh, thickness of asphalt pavement. And you see here, uh, VS, uh, which is a seismic shear wave velocity, is considered as a synonym to stiffness. And I will talk about why on my uh, next slide. And I believe yeah, most of you are uh, involved in this uh, road business uh, in one way or uh, uh, another. So uh, I don't have to uh, uh, talk about the why, what the importance of these two parameters. Instead, I will talk more about the how we can do it uh, during uh, my presentation. So uh, the parent seismic technique from which this uh, non-contact seismic uh, technique evolved is called the MASW, uh, Multi-Channel Analysis of Surface Waves, which was uh, developed almost uh, 20 years ago for near surface investigation, like the uh, uh, 20 or 30 meter depth range. And uh, it generates, uh, it, it analyzes the seismic surface waves and then uh, generates uh, this kind of a typical uh, so-called shear wave velocity cross-section, where we see a uh, low shear wave velocity is uh, corresponds to uh, soft materials like a soil, whereas the uh, high shear wave velocities corresponds to hard materials like the uh, uh, bedrock. And on the right hand side is uh, uh, shown why shear wave velocity is uh, considered as a synonym to stiffness of a material. Well, uh, in short, the stiffness property of a solid material represents the solid material's resistance to external deformation. So pre to precisely describe the stiffness property, we have been using so-called three elastic moduli. The first one is called the Young's modulus, which is uh, a material's resistance to longitudinal deformation. The second one is called the shear modulus, which is material's resistance to transverse deformation. The last one is called the bulk modulus, which is uh, material's resistance to volume change. So to precisely describe the uh, stiffness property of a solid material, we need to measure all these three moduli uh, independently. When it comes to geotechnical material, we can often ignore this bulk modulus because there is a little volume change involved. So let's take a look at defining equations for these two moduli. Shear modulus defining equation is here and uh, uh, Young's modulus defining equation is here. But in short, there are three terms. The first term is a density. The second term is a Poisson's ratio or P wave velocity. They are linked together. And the last term is a shear wave velocity. We can see shear wave velocity is included in both defining equations as a square term. What that means is it is the most sensitive term and also contributing most. In addition, for the other two terms of density and Poisson's ratio, in reality, or in uh, yeah, in reality, we usually know pretty good appro approximation values. For example, density for most of the geotechnical materials can be conveniently considered as a 2.0 gram per cubic centimeter. And the Poisson's ratio for asphalt material can be considered as somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4, or more conveniently, 0.35, like that. On the other hand, this shear wave velocity can vary a lot. For example, very soft soil 
chain wave velocity can be lower than 50 meters per second, whereas for very competent bedrock, it can exceed 2,500 meters per second. So that's why it is so important to measure shear wave velocity as much accurately as possible whenever we need stiffness, we need to measure stiffness uh, property of uh, geotechnical materials. So uh, let me talk about the, uh, a little bit uh, about the historical background of this seismic technique development. Um, Park and Richter, uh, 2017, uh, uh, MN actually uh, performed the, uh, uh, the conventional MASW surveys by using this kind of a quadruple land streamers uh, with the uh, geophones. Um, during the uh, so-called uh, FDR, full depth reclamation uh, road construction, and uh, uh, they came up with uh, this kind of uh, shear wave velocity plan view maps at five different stages uh, during the construction. So those maps uh, uh, clearly uh, show uh, shear wave velocity or stiffness variation within the test segment of the area and also through the different stages uh, of the uh, construction. So at that time, uh, the depth range was uh, somewhere between 0.5 meter and uh, about two meter. So these uh, uh, stiffness values or shear wave velocity values represent uh, those uh, stiffness property within that uh, depth range, 0.5 and the two meter uh, depth range as a whole. So at this time, it, uh, it was a, a sufficient proof of concept that uh, MSW surveys can be used for uh, quality management of the uh, uh, road construction. But uh, it could not resolve this uh, top surface uh, pavement layer because of the regions I will talk about uh, in a minute. And so this project uh, particularly deals with the, this top pavement layer. So in that sense, this project can be regarded as a continuation of the previous year, SAMS project. So now uh, this is the historical uh, uh, development of the, uh, the seismic technique applied for this specific uh, pavement layer. Ryden right era 2004, uh, Dr. Ryden used the, uh, this uh, accelerometer approach. Well, with the uh, original version of MASW, which uh, uses the geophones, uh, we cannot use the geophones for pavement analysis because uh, geophones can deal with the uh, depth range tens of meters. But here, when it comes to pavement, it becomes very, very thin. The thickness is 10 centimeter, 20 centimeter, and 30 centimeters, not 30 meters. So in terms of dimension, it is a uh, kind of microscopic dimension in comparison to the normal dimension dealt with the uh, uh, original version of MASW. So geophones cannot be used and the frequency range uh, is a tens of kilohertz. Geophones usually can record uh, frequencies up to uh, several hundred hertz. So that's why uh, Dr. Wyden was using this uh, accelerometer, uh, which is a very sensitive device and uh, can record very high frequencies. And he had to put some uh, grease at the bottom of this uh, accelerometer at that time to ensure very good coupling between this accelerometer and the pavement the surface. And then came up with uh, this very nicely developed the uh, lamp wave dispersion trend. By the way, uh, the type of surface waves uh, developed inside this kind of pavement layer is called lamp wave. So lamp wave is a specific type of surface wave. And also when it comes to surface wave analysis, Coming up with this kind of very well defined dispersion pattern is the most critical part because from which we can deduce shear wave velocity and thickness of the pavement layer. So uh, Dr. Friedan at that time came up with the shear wave velocity and the thickness of this pavement layer, both of which correlated very well with the uh, uh, true values. So at that time, this uh, uh, approach was regarded as a very uh, a phenomenal uh, approach and the sufficient proof of concept that seismic approach can be used to evaluate the uh, multi-channel seismic concept that can be used to evaluate the uh, thickness and the uh, shear wave velocity property of the uh, pavement. But for that approach to become practical uh, uh, technique uh, to be routinely used in the field, it was still far away. The main reason was it was uh, 
it took so much time, for example, uh, to make one measurement along this three meter transect. Uh, the survey itself took about half hour. And then the subsequent data analysis, which was a completely manual approach, took another 10 more minutes. And the main drawback was uh, uh, this uh, accelerometer that required a very cumbersome process to ensure that uh, good coupling. So uh, if we were to, at that time, if we, we were to use this approach to cover certain area of the uh, uh, asphalt pavement, like a 300 feet by 12 feet, with a three feet by three feet uh, resolution, it's gonna take uh, about 12, 240 hours, which is uh, 10 full days, which is completely impractical. And then a few years later, uh, Dr. Ryden uh, got rid of this accelerometer and then used this microphone hanging in the air about uh, 10 centimeter above the uh, pavement surface, and then came up with almost identical dispersion trend. And this one illustrates how it was possible to use microphone to record surface waves developed inside this pavement layer. Well, this is a, a snapshot of numerical modeling, and this is a solid plate representing the pavement layer, and this is a fluid representing air body. And we apply an impact at the center of this setting, and we see surface waves are propagating into both directions. And we also see small amount of energy leaking into air body. That is picked by this microphone. So that is called the leaking mode of surface waves. So all of a sudden, the measurement that can be a uh, rolling measurement. In other words, the, the, the receiver array can be uh, completely non-contact, hanging in the air, and it can move while the measurements are, are being made. And the, uh, that's Ryder and his student later uh, came up with this approach. Uh, this is a 48 channel MEMS microphone array. One MEMS microphone is a very tiny device, smaller than your uh, thumbnail size. So this array has a, a 48 channel, 48 MEMS microphones uh, arranged with, uh, I believe, a 0.75 centimeter uh, spacing. So total length of this array is uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, smaller than a half meter. And that this array uh, was hanging in the air, uh, 10 centimeter, about 10 centimeter above the pavement surface. And, and they used the, uh, this uh, solenoid impact source. So when you switch, uh, when you push a switch, then it makes uh, a very gentle impact on the pavement surface. And then came up with a very uh, good uh, uh, measurement result of shear wave velocities. Along this uh, uh, four meter long uh, test segment, and uh, but uh, so everything could move or could roll, but the, 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 the problem, the issue at this time was that the moving speed was too slow. It could move, uh, I mean, the, the maximum speed, rolling speed was uh, 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 slower than half mile per hour. So again, at this time, well, at this time, the main drawback was on this uh, uh, impact source, not on the receivers. Because the, this impact source uh, had to be almost stationary to make a proper impact. By the way, we see a different color here represented at the measurements results at different temperatures. So we all know asphalt stiffness changes with the uh, temperature. So whenever we make the tissue uh, shear wave velocity measurement, we also make the uh, uh, temperature measurement as well. So when we represent the shear wave velocity of uh, asphalt, then we also uh, represent uh, associated temperature uh, as well. So uh, a few years later, right around 2019, got rid of that uh, solenoid impact source and used the, uh, this uh, so-called bouncing steel ball, as we see here, where they used the same 48-channel MEMS microphone array, but uh, they used the, uh, this very tiny uh, steel ball, but at this time, they were using two steel balls, so one on the front side and the other one on the back side, mainly to uh, compensate for possible tilting effect of this uh, uh, microphone array. But for our project, we are now using only one uh, steel ball uh, on the front side. So this ball, steel ball is hanging down from this frame uh, through a, a very thin wire. 
and uh, it will make uh, uh, it will bounce uh, up and down, making an uh, uh, impact spontaneously when everything is in forward motion. So they came up with the, uh, this very nicely uh, 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 developed uh, lamb wave field record. And on my next slide, I will show you how this uh, uh, the impact source uh, uh, works when everything is in motion. So this is kind of a high speed video. So again, they were using both the front side and the back side in uh, steel balls, but uh, I think uh, the front side makes the uh, more frequent impacts. You see, bang, 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 like that. So that's how that each uh, steel ball makes the, the impact spontaneously. So uh, our project uh, uh, tries to uh, develop a complete system consisting of uh, this kind of uh, A2D conversion unit and also uh, uh, multiple number of uh, MEMS microphone arrays arranged along the transverse direction so that it can cover certain width of the uh, asphalt pavement simultaneously. And uh, we are now aiming at the, at the total width of this uh, uh, array uh, is will uh, to be uh, about four feet wide, but we are not sure if we can make it, but that's our current goal. Uh, if that is possible, then uh, those arrays will be arranged with the one foot uh, separation and everything will be able to, uh, will be moving at a speed somewhere between 10 and 30 miles per hour. And this one common impact ball, steel ball, will generate the, uh, uh, the, the uh, seismic waves on the uh, pavement surface. And then the uh, uh, onboard computer equipped with the, uh, uh, the analysis software will be analyzing all the incoming seismic data in uh, real-time mode. And then uh, the output results will be displayed in pseudo real-time mode in uh, pseudo 3D uh, mode as illustrated here. So if we use this technique, then the previous, uh, then the, the, the area previously illustrated, uh, which, uh, I mean, if we, if we were to use the original contact approach, it would take 240 hours, 10 full days. But if we use this approach, it's going to take less than 10 minutes. So uh, to cover about the uh, a half mile long asphalt pavement, uh, about 12 feet wide uh, width, uh, even with the higher resolution, like the two feet along the uh, longitudinal direction and one foot along the transverse direction, uh, total time will be less than 25 minutes. The survey time will, will, will not exceed more than a few minutes, like the two or three minutes will be enough to complete the survey. But if you can wait 20 more minutes inside the car, then the computer uh, will display all the output results on the screen. And these are kind of an illustration of our final uh, display of the uh, final results. Uh, first, there will be a shear wave velocity display uh, in, in a plan view map. This direction is a longitudinal direction, and this is a transverse direction. So it will cover about 12 feet wide uh, pavement area. And uh, this map will be continuously uh, growing as the, uh, the, uh, the survey continues. And then there will be similar type of a temperature map being displayed as well. And then there will be a thickness uh, a map uh, uh, displayed in a similar manner uh, also. We were originally uh, considering uh, using two different, two independent approaches for thickness evaluation. The first one was based upon lamb wave dispersion pattern analysis. The second one was based upon impact of echo analysis, but now we completely abandoned this uh, impact echo approach because of three reasons. First, its accuracy is lower than this first approach, lamb wave dispersion uh, analysis. And second reason is that it takes a much longer time than this lamb wave dispersion analysis. The last reason is it has a little room for automation. And I will talk a little bit more about this here. Automat automatic uh, uh, analysis in a minute. And then uh, our measured shear wave velocities will be converted into shear and uh, Young's moduli. 
and the similar type of maps for those two uh, moduli will be displayed as well. So uh, we procured this 64-channel uh, national instrument the PXI system uh, for that uh, HD conversion. Uh, and this 64-channel will be uh, assigned into four arrays. So each array will be equipped, equipped with 16 channels. And now we are using GPS receiver and the infrared temperature sensor, and both of which uh, make a measurement at every one second during the survey. And uh, this is uh, uh, the beginning uh, interface, user interface part of the, uh, the software package uh, under development, uh, which is called the PacSize HMA. PacSize is the, the parent software that was originally developed for the normal version of the MASW surveys that deals with the uh, uh, tens of meters of near surface uh, setting, like the soil and bedrock setting. Uh, and uh, that, that package has been a continuous modification to meet uh, these, these special needs for this uh, particular project. And that package is called the uh, PACSAS HMA. And basically there are uh, two uh, different modes, uh, two different modes at the gate uh, interface of this software package. One is called in-field mode. The other one is called in-office mode. In-field mode is the, the, the mode that you will be using while you are out in the field and it will be uh, analyzing all the incoming data uh, in real-time mode and try to uh, display uh, output results as fast as possible on your computer screen. So uh, although your survey will be uh, very high spatial uh, sampling density, like uh, one, uh, two feet along the longitudinal direction and the one foot along the transverse direction, but this infield mode will be analyzing data uh, by so, a certain degree of decimation, like uh, uh, 10 feet along the longitudinal direction and two feet along the transverse direction. The main purpose is uh, to uh, display the, the results uh, uh, as fast as possible. But I think that that kind of decimation, still the, a little bit uh, lower the, uh, spatial sampling density, will be enough to, uh, for uh, QA QC purposes while you are out in the field. And then once you come back to your office, then you can let this in-office mode run overnight by using the full density of the data that you collected during the day. And then next morning, you will be able to see the full density, full resolution output results on your computer screen. Well, there have been many challenges, uh, not only in the development of hardware system, but also uh, in the development of the software package. The biggest challenge in software analysis algorithm is uh, uh, how to properly handle this uh, um, so-called direct airway. Whenever you make an impact on the surface of the uh, solid material, you also uh, uh, generate a direct airway, which is a bang sound, which is picked by this microphone as the strongest uh, uh, wave arrival pattern, as we see here. This is actual field record. And we see direct airway uh, takes the, the strongest the, uh, uh, wave arrival pattern. And uh, this is a noise. This is not our signal. And our signal is a surface wave, land wave uh, arrival pattern, which is vaguely seen here because of the domination by the uh, airway uh, in the, uh, uh, the field record. So if we use this raw field as is to make uh, the, the so-called dispersion image, then we will see only direct airway information, which is not something we need. Our signal uh, dispersion pattern, which is a land wave dispersion pattern, is completely missing here. So we have to get rid of this uh, airway through so-called the mute process. And then only after that, we will be able to see our signal wave Land waves, uh, land waves very clearly. Only at that time, we can use that uh, field data to generate this, uh, uh, this person image in which we see this our uh, land wave uh, this person pattern is clearly uh, constructed. So it is very critical to mute out this uh, direct air wave as much as possible without damaging our signal land waves. So if we apply this muting <clears throat> process manually, 
then we can always be successful by getting rid of this L wave completely and leave this signal M wave intact. But here in this project, we are dealing with thousands of field data from one survey. So it is almost impossible to apply this muting process, manual muting process for thousands of field records. So that's why it had to be completely automatic process and the development of that algorithm took a lot of time. And then uh, this one shows how this shear wave velocity and the thickness are uh, evaluated from our measured dispersion image. This is actually uh, one of the, uh, the field records of dispersion image. And we see lamb wave dispersion pattern is very well developed and it becomes almost horizontal at very high frequency n. And it, it approaches to an asymptotic value of phase velocity from which we can calculate shear wave velocity by assuming a constant value of Poisson's ratio. So that's how we calculate the uh, shear wave velocity. And then by using shear wave velocity and Poisson's ratio, we can model for the model theoretical uh, land wave dispersion curves for different thicknesses. We, we increment the uh, different thicknesses by one millimeter each time, and then try to find the, uh, uh, the thickness uh, whose theoretical dispersion curve matches uh, most closely uh, the background uh, the measured dispersion trend. So that's how uh, thickness is evaluated. So we built our first uh, uh, 1D uh, MEMS microphone array uh, this January. It is a 16 channel, and this is a 16 channel MEMS microphone array covered with the uh, uh, protected with the, uh, the, the, the fabric cloth uh, to protect it from moisture and the water uh, on the uh, pavement surface and also uh, dirt and grains are popping up from, from the surface. And uh, the total length is about 35 centimeter long and uh, this is a rolling impact source touching the ground right now. And uh, it is placed about 15 centimeter ahead of the CL receiver. And uh, this is the same system uh, viewed from the backside. And we see this uh, array is in perfect uh, parallel uh, with the, uh, this pavement surface. But along the transverse direction, we see that uh, that array is slightly tilted, and that tilting is intentional to minimize the multiple reflections of the sound wave generated from this impact trapped between this array and the pavement surface. So uh, this February, uh, the Norfit had uh, executed the first the joint field test. Uh, uh, by joint field test, I mean uh, they brought out the, their own uh, uh, 1D hardware system. Along with the, uh, the, this field laptop computer equipped with the uh, size HMA uh, software package, so that while they were uh, making a, a measurement, uh, this uh, software package was analyzing all the incoming data in real-time mode and displaying the output results uh, in uh, about uh, 10 minutes on the computer screen. And this one shows the, uh, all the uh, measured uh, GPS points and the uh, uh, Norfit have collected about 2,000 data points along this uh, test road, which was about one kilometer long. Uh, this site is uh, nearby uh, Lund, Sweden. And this one shows one of the uh, displays by uh, a pack size HMA software package. And this one basically displays uh, the quality of incoming seismic data. Basically here we see the quality is uh, 94, overall quality is uh, 94, 94%, which means 94% uh, of uh, measured wave field is our lamp signal, and only 6% of that uh, wave field is noise which means the quality is extremely good. And indeed, um, this is one of those yeah, 2016 channel field records. This is uh, one field record that is played with the normal gain uh, on the left side and with the high gain on the right side. And uh, raw data uh, displayed on the top row uh, and uh, muted data displayed at the bottom row. So this is uh, the same one field record. But uh, if, uh, let's focus on to this uh, uh, muted record. We see these are land waves. Very clean and very strong amplitudes. 
they look like a numerical data. So again, this represents extremely high quality LAM waves. This indicates that uh, when the uh, system, uh, acquisition system works very well. So these are the results from the, that uh, joint field test. Uh, we see here uh, sh show a velocity uh, values along this uh, uh, 2000 data points along uh, about one kilometer long and distance. And the values are uh, uh, somewhere between 1700 and 1900 meter per second. Um, the average value is about the 1800 meter per second. And uh, there is uh, some anomalous area here, which co correlates with the, uh, the bridge uh, on, the, uh, on the road. And also this is your uh, thickness uh, values uh, for that uh, 2000 uh, data points. And uh, we see uh, overall thickness is uh, about 10 centimeter. And there is a variation uh, plus minus about uh, one centimeter, but most of the data show uh, the uh, measure the thickness is uh, uh, 10 centimeter. And this is a temperature data. Temperature uh, does not change much. Um, this is a seven degree Celsius and this is eight degree Celsius. So for about one kilometer long uh, distance, the temperature variation is uh, less than uh, one degree in Celsius. And uh, we believe that these values of shear wave velocity and the thickness are quite realistic and quite uh, reasonable, but we are currently seeking for other source of information to check the validity. So this is the 2D system uh, we are currently discussing and about to start building. And I believe uh, Dr. Wyden can uh, uh, comment uh, uh, better than I do. Niels? Uh, yes. This is uh, a sketch of the, the 2D system we're, we're currently uh, uh, building and uh, hopefully testing soon. So instead of four parallel arrays, we have uh, with each in, with uh, an individual source for each array. We have one source in the, in the center here, and then we have the four arrays in different angles. And we also want to be able to move the arrays uh, so that we can change the distance because uh, when the temperature is high, we need to be close to the source. And uh, that also means that we will cover a smaller 2D area when the temperature is, is hot or warm. But then when it's colder, we can, we can cover a larger 2D uh, area. And we want the 2D area to be as, as wide as possible. So that's why we're, we're planning on testing this right now. And um, it's also the, um, the design we, um, we came up with for, for simplicity and robustness of the source. We already tried using two different sources and uh, we think four different sources will be um, yeah, causing too much trouble. So that's why the arrays are angled like this, so they can all pick up the surface wave from one common source. Okay. So okay. I can just shortly mention that the, the whole 2D array also needs to be leveled with a pavement. So that's another issue that uh, it needs to be adjustable and uh, it cannot be tilted. So it's not parallel to the ground. It's very important that the whole array is parallel to the surface. So that's what we're working on right now in Sweden. All right, um, I have one more slide to present, uh, which is this one. Uh, this is overall schedule of our project. Again, uh, as I said uh, earlier, this is, uh, this is supposed to be a two year project and it's supposed to end by the end of this year. Uh, and uh, we think we are somewhere over here and uh, about 60% complete. Uh, but we are currently seeking for the extension of this uh, project period. We are not seeking for any additional budget, but we are simply seeking for the extension of the uh, project period because of two reasons. First is uh, uh, we think that yeah, the North Tech will be able to finish all uh, hardware uh, system sometime late this year. And then uh, Norpitech can uh, uh, deliver that system to Park Seismic. Then we 
can use the system for our field testing, which will help a lot uh, in terms of our software uh, uh, development and in refining and the uh, improving the software uh, uh, the performance. So that is the main reason. The second reason is uh, uh, we know uh, the next year's NRA conference may take place uh, sometime in June uh, in Minnesota. So if that's the case, then I believe uh, we will be able to make the, uh, our final delivery and uh, a demonstration uh, during that conference. This is it, and uh, thank you very much. And I really appreciate the uh, Jason Richter and the uh, Lauren Dow at uh, MN Dot for organizing and uh, uh, preparing uh, this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chun and Niels and Jason for the introduction. Um, I do have a number of questions here, so I think we should get going through those. Um, the first question comes from Raul. Um, the shear modulus in a viscoelastic medium such as HMA is complex and frequent and frequency dependent quantity as opposed to the linear elastic formulation currently used in this project. Can the research team comment on this limitation for interpretation um, further for estimation of Young's modulus of HMA? Uh, Poisson's ratio is also a temperature and frequency dependent quality quantity. Yeah, I think that's a very good question, <laughs> and uh, uh, I believe uh, we will represent our final result of shear wave velocity, uh, not only along with the uh, temperature, but also along with the, uh, the the main frequency range that we used to calculate the uh, that uh, uh, shear wave velocity. Um, uh, Niels, do you have any further comments? Um, yeah, that's right. It's uh, right now we're only um presenting one result which is a high frequency and uh result from the stiffness and um so although we're measuring the surface wave over a, a range of frequencies that that range is is quite small in terms of the stiffness change with frequency at these high high frequencies so we're just taking one average like high frequency value at this point and uh, here in Sweden, we made some comparisons to complex uh, master curves, both the uh, stiffness and Poisson's ratio. So I I'm copying a, a link to that paper in the QA uh, bar here. So there's much more details uh, to, to discuss about this question. It's a good question. And uh, right now we're simplifying it, presenting just one value, which is a high frequency value at the current temperature, which we're also measuring. But uh, it's, it's gonna be very important to keep this in mind when you, when you do these measurements, of course. So I hope you got the link in the QA. Yes, I see that link answer there. So hopefully people Maybe can see that and come up to the right copy question, that link, but... yeah. All right, next question is from Eab. Excellent and very exciting work. Regarding the thickness calculation, how does the system know the end interface of the asphalt concrete layer? What if there are more than one layer of HMA? Yeah, that is another excellent question as well. And uh, here, in terms of thickness evaluation, uh, we try to evaluate uh, only the top layer although they may be uh, multiple layers. Uh, and we assume that top layer has a significant uh, stiffness contrast uh, with the, the, the layer existing below. And the, the thickness range that we are currently uh, set uh, is somewhere between five centimeters and 30 centimeters. So again, uh, the, the thickness uh, range is, it, it has, a, has to be within that 5 centimeter and the 30 centimeter range. And also the top layer should have a significant uh, contrast in shear wave velocity uh, with the, the, the layer that may be existing below. And by significant, we don't know yet, but uh, I believe we are, uh, 
at least the about 20% uh, difference in shear wave velocity. Niels, you have any uh, other comment? Uh, no, that's right. We, we cannot resolve the different layers right now unless they're significantly different in stiffness. So at this point, we have to take an average value. Okay. Next question comes from Raghu. Uh, what are the main differences between GPR and this method? Um, GPR basically is a uh, electromagnetic method and it, it is a <clears throat> so-called the imaging approach. In other words, it tries to measure uh, the boundary between two different uh, materials. So if we are to use the GPR approach, for pavement evaluation. Basically, we are trying to measure uh, the pavement the thickness variation along the, uh, the survey transit. And uh, I, I don't know how much GPR can measure uh, any stiffness uh, related properties of uh, pavement. Uh, I know there is a certain uh, uh, research uh, that tries to uh, deduce a certain information from GPR data that can be related to that uh, stiffness property. And I don't know how much effective that approach is. Okay. Uh, the next question comes again from Iab. The final version of your system appears to be air coupled, uh, hanging in the air and would be operating in the frequency range of one to 30,000 uh, Hertz. In the US, we have a frequency range limit. Have you checked if they apply to your system? Uh, frequency limitation? In, uh, in, in uh, the radio signal, or we, we, we are actually measuring uh, the analog signal from the microphone. So I don't know why. That, that limitation applies to uh, our system. Do you, does anyone uh, have any uh, better information about this question? Um, maybe Yab can uh, respond again in the Q&A to help us out. Um, we'll just move on to Dai's questions here uh, as well. Um, can you elaborate more on the mute method to remove direct airwaves? Um, and then the second question is, is it possible to record the wave by microphone? Um, is it possible the recorded wave by microphone is also affected by environmental noise? Yes, first the muting is simply zeroing out uh, the, the amplitudes in your uh, digital signal. So in other words, if you see a certain pattern on your uh, multi-channel record, uh, created by a rival pattern of that uh, sound wave, then you make uh, 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 you draw a line, a linear line at the uh, onset uh, trend of that uh, air wave, and then you make uh, all data below that uh, slope, below that a uh, uh, drawn line, zero. So that is a mute. But at that time, you have to be careful in terms of uh, applying proper tapering. Otherwise, that abrupt muting will cause another uh, a, a noise phenomena on your uh, final 2D wave field transformation. So, so in short, muting itself means you are zeroing out your amplitudes for sound wave. Okay. And then the next question was: uh, Is it Lauren, possible? Was the, the, yeah. Is it possible the recorded wave by microphone is also affected by environmental noise? Uh, I think so. I think so. But here we are dealing with a, a very high frequency. Usually our uh, signal frequency range is uh, somewhere between 20 kilohertz and 30 kilohertz. That's the most of critical uh, 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 frequency range for shear wave velocity uh, calculation, and which is uh, usually beyond the, uh, the normal uh, uh, audible uh, sound wave uh, range. Uh, 
And then the lower frequencies, like the, uh, uh, below uh, 20 kilohertz, uh, that usually presents kind of a curve, the uh, uh, lamb wave dispersion pattern. And if that, that is generated, I believe that is usually uh, taking a much stronger energy. But, but in short, I think that there, there, there can be some uh, ambient noise included. But so far, we didn't have any uh, significant uh, ambient noise uh, uh, interruption. What about you, Nils? Have you ever uh, experienced uh, that, that uh, ambient noise uh, damaging your data in the past? Uh... No, the, no the noise goes up with the uh, driving speed and uh, wind speed and uh, car other cars passing by and so on, but it's not, uh, so far, it hasn't really disturbed the measurements. So we even recorded data while trucks have been passing by because it's so high frequency, it, uh, it's okay. So there is more noise with the wind and uh, speed of the car and so on, but not uh, not to the point where it's not possible to do the measurements so far. Okay. Well, more one more, one more oh. comment, Nils. Uh, by speed of a car, you mean uh, as a car drives faster, it generates a uh, uh, stronger uh, air, air uh, swirling around that uh, microphone array, and that becomes a noise? Is that what you, what you meant? Yeah, yeah, exactly. When we've been testing different driving speeds, you can see that the uh, kind of noise level goes up with the driving speed. Then uh, that, that any uh, simple operators uh, in front of uh, the microphone array making kind of streamline the uh, barrier, will it help? Uh, maybe, but it's uh, it's only a, sm a small increase, so it's it's no problem okay. so Got far. It. Got it. Go ahead, Lauren. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, the next question is from Paul. Uh, he said he apologizes if he missed this. What is the data accuracy with increased thickness? That is another very good question. Um, well, overall, uh, I believe yeah, the shear wave velocity evaluation is achieved the highest accuracy. I, I would say yeah, the accuracy will be less than five. I mean, accuracy will be higher than the error range will be uh, less than 5%. I would say pro probably plus or minus 3% in the shear wave velocity measurement, but thickness measurement will be uh, a little a little bit more than that. I would say right now uh, is a plus or minus a 10 percent, but we continuously making efforts uh, to increase or to reduce that error range through uh, different uh, access. I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of a subsidiary approaches, but uh, using the same uh, lamb wave dispersion uh, based approach. So yeah, so in short, shear wave velocity plus or minus three percent for thickness plus or minus 10 percent. Okay. Uh, next question here is from Steve. What depth can this see and will it be sensitive to the quality of the pavement like old versus new? And I, I think maybe you possibly addressed some of this in a previous answer. I believe the uh, Nils can answer better. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a good question. We haven't really tested that much different uh, pavements so far where we have referenced data and so on, but uh, I think you can clearly see uh, we tested uh, brand new pavements and old ones here and you can definitely see that there's more, much more variability and lower shear wave velocity on the old ones you know, compared at the at same temperature and so on. So I think the variability could be also an uh, interesting result in this, these measurements because the new pavements show very small variability. Then I, I mean the scattering shear wave velocity as we drive along, while old ones will uh, vary a lot more. Great, uh, this is the last question that I have um, that I'm able to see. Uh, this comes from Caleb. How does surface texture or roughness affect the outcomes? Um, I, think that's something, I think that's something uh, Nils commented as well. Nils, you have any yeah, other? 
It's a, it's a good question uh, that we haven't really compared or, or run into so far, but maybe really open mixes with a lot a lot of air voids can can affect these measurements, and you can yeah it will influence the the stiffness maybe um, maybe differently with these measurements than conventional dynamic modulus tests. I don't know. That's a good question. But I don't think the influence will be much. So far, we have seen that the brand new pavements, which still have the still have the bitumen on the stones on the surface, it's a little bit harder to get good good signals because our impactor is kind of get kind of damped. But this is only like the first days when it's it's totally brand new. So that is an effect of the the roughness or texture that we've seen so far. We get better signal when the, when we have the real stones in, on the surface. Okay, great. Well, if there are clear any enough, but... other questions, um, better get them in now. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I think, um, looks like Caleb said, thanks. Um, and that must have answered his question. So um, thank you all for joining us today and thank you Chun and Niels for that in-depth presentation. And um, we hope you can check out the project page. Uh, we will be back next month with a presentation from the Federal Highways uh, Association uh, or administration. And um, we hope you all have a great day.